So I was asked to talk about associating the moon with the ocean tide. And the challenge I was set was to uh, talk about when were the moon's effects on the tides discovered and how has the subject developed. Well, it's easier to talk about the second half of that than it is the first, because clearly there were not many written records for the first part. Uh, so what I'm really going to do is to uh, briefly mention um, the ocean tide as we understand it today. Uh, and that puts things in context a bit. And then, uh, and then race through a little bit through history about why our ancestors must have known about, about the moon's association with the tides. Um, early insights from the ancient world, which is, has several names which uh, Carolyn mentioned. Newton, people like that. And then uh, some recent developments. So if you've lived all your life in Oxford and you've never been to the, to the coast, what is the tide? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, two, it's two things depending on what sort of person you are. What, the obvious thing is the rise and fall of the water level. And uh, sometimes in Bristol, Liverpool, uh, French coast, that can be um, enormous. Uh, if you're a mariner, though, what you're really interested in currents, tidal currents reversing. And um, of course, both, both of them is the tide. So I live in Liverpool, that's low tide in the Mersey um, on that day, a spring low tide, mud banks, and then you come back six hours later and you have a 11 metres of water um, on top of what it was before. So that's the tide for you. So I had a discussion before this morning about to explain why there are two tides a day. Um, uh, so if you, if you simply take, this is textbook stuff, if you simply take um, uh, the Earth, and you assume that the Earth is uniformly covered by water, a uniform motion, and off to the right you have an object, that could be the moon or the sun, then you, you have a, a tidal force which goes towards that object, and you have a tidal force which goes away from that object, and that's because the, the, the ocean on the near side, the ocean on the far side are further away, and the solid Earth in the middle are all for, at different distances from your object on the right. So there's a differential involved here in, in the maths, and this means that the, the tidal forces are not, um, like usually in gravity, things are proportional to 1 over r squared. In this case, uh, tidal forces are always proportional to 1 over r cubed, and, uh, and also proportional uh, to the mass of the object that you're talking about. So tidal forces uh, are always proportional to um, m over r cubed, like this. So the moon and the sun. So the sun is much larger than the moon, obviously, but that R cubed is the, is the real killer thing in this. The moon is much closer, so it exerts much larger tidal forces um, on the Earth's ocean, and even on the solid Earth underneath. So as a result, the lunar tides are about two and a half times larger than the solar tides. So the moon is much more important. Um, so this, uh, I don't know if you followed a few weeks ago, uh, this, I think it's a Brexit-related <laughs> debate uh, about um, this guy, you can probably recognize, uh, claiming that the sun was the dominant thing. I think it was something to do with world trade or something, really. Um, but so he was clearly wrong, and he picked the wrong argument with the wrong, the wrong people. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is, uh, uh, of course, the, the moon and the sun. The sun is important. It's uh, one, two and a half to one, roughly, but the sun is important. And when, as you know, when they line up at springs, uh, spring tides, when the moon and the sun are in alignment, or maybe when the moon is on the opposite side of the Earth, but still in alignment, then you end up with spring tides, uh, nothing to do with spring, as once a fortnight. Or when the moon is up in its first or last quarter, you end up with neap tides. So I'm racing through this, really, but this is a fortnight of uh, tide level at Liverpool. So you go through, in a fortnight, you go from, from neap tides, when the moon is in, in, in its quarters, uh, through springs, and then back to neaps again. Now that object I showed you before, I showed you really was on the equator, but of course the moon and the sun are never on the equator. They're always at some angle, some declination off the equator, and the effect of the declination is to generate daily tides, not twice daily tides. And um, so the tides that you get are actually quite complicated, and, and in different parts of the world you get different tidal patterns. So on this um, slide here, uh, we take Bermuda for example, this example. So Bermuda is very like the tides around Britain, the British coast, twice a day, uh, neaps through springs, through neaps, through springs and so on. Other parts of the world, like parts of the Australian coast, they're actually diurnal, they're once a day, 
but, and that's generated by the, the declination, the moon's declination. So, um, that's, that's this, in a nutshell, that's what the tides are, proportional to mass over r cubed. And we had that uh, thing last Monday with the supermoon, and uh, this is when the moon was uh, pretty close to the Earth for, for many years. And the, the lunar tides uh, then were, were large, actually, very large indeed. Uh, why, was, why did nobody care? It's because it's the wrong time of year, that the solar tides were actually quite small. And if this had occurred um, a few weeks ago, it would have been very interesting indeed. Um, but actually, um, it wasn't interesting, because it is, it's not at the equinoxes. So, um, the solar tides are important as well. So, let's get to what I was supposed to be talking about, which is um, our ancestors on the tide. And the general point I want to make is that we live in a very place which has been pretty close to the sea 4,000 years ago. All this was land, it's called, it's called Doggerland. And uh, our ancestors grew up um, needing to get food from the, from the coast. And uh, you'll find many evidence about that in Denmark, there are these uh, refuges that people built, actually built these hills to, so that they could survive um, close to the sea and make a living. And uh, much of the, the coastal um, ecology is based on um, on spring tides. So these are the two examples from America, in fact, the fiddle crabs and, and the grenium that you must have heard about on the Californian coast. These are closely linked to spring tides. And um, so our ancestors must have known about that. They might have understood things properly, but they must have had an inkling. And later on, of course, there are many examples of using the tide um, very seriously. These are examples of fish traps in the Menai Straits in North Wales. And of course, much later, people started to industrialize and build tide mills and things. So our ancestors must have known a lot about it. And uh, there's a lot of tidal folklore if you go back to the literature. There's this thing which uh, um, comes back to Aristotle. Uh, I'll come on to him again in a minute. But there's this um, uh, legend that nobody dies, no animal dies when the tide is ebbing, which is good news because it means you have to choose when you want to die, really, isn't it? Really? Um, you have a half, 50% chance of uh, dying tonight. Um, and this was um, imported into other types of literature much later. And there's a thing I've never understood, but some parts of northeast England, um, as, as late as roughly 1600, when um, in parish records they recorded the state of the tide when people died. I never, I never actually understood why that was. But there are many, many legends in many, many societies. And um, uh, yeah, so people must have a, a very, very some idea of this that association. But the really um, big development really was um, as you go back through, through um, the Greco-Roman world and um, various um, megalithic monuments have been discussed in previous talks. Um, some of these of course are up the coast and in some, um, my former boss spent ages trying to associate some of these things with tide, tidal, as, as some, as some kind of tidal observatory. And I think it's, uh, uh, he failed. I think this is, this is, to some extent, this idea that they had something to do with tides, rather than, rather than astronomy in general. But, but I don't think they had anything explicitly to do with tides or such. Um, I think that's the general opinion now. But uh, if you go back far enough, this is, and this is a, in the Indus civilization in India, and here then they built, um, a, a supposedly built a, what's called a wet dock, that's, the tides here are, are enormous as well in this part of the world. And, and the, um, they built um, a dock just like Liverpool did in 1715, eventually. But this dock but was, um, it was a high tide, so that the, the dock had gates uh, for ships to go in and out. And as well as, if this is correct, then as well as being an enormous um, civil engineering achievement, they must have known exactly when the tide was going to be and in order to, to do this. They couldn't have built it without having some intuition, some knowledge of the tide itself. So on to what Carolines down with the Greeks and Romans. And um, this is when things really started, observational science really kicked off pretty much here. So I'll just mention these things here. Even though these guys lived in the Mediterranean, they knew perfectly well that the tides were larger um, <coughs> somewhere else. And especially, there was a lot of discussion about the tides of Gades, which is modern day, it is. And I'll just um, mention some of these 
these characters which have been mentioned in previous talks. The thing is that these were very good observation lists. What they didn't have was a theory. There was no physical theory. And they wouldn't have until Newton came along, basically. So there's all kinds of stuff which is uh, involving breathing, heating of the planet, or pressing of the atmosphere, all kinds of descriptive, poetic sort of stuff. But there was no real theory behind it. Uh, one, one guy to mention uh, is Pythias, who made, supposed to have made this, I'm not sure I believe it, but he, he was supposed to have made this remarkable journey from Marseille all the way up to Iceland and back and, um, in 300 BC. And on the way, he, he, he remarked about on the enormous tides that occur, occur around Britain, which is um, a good observation. Now, coming on to Aristotle, of course, again, has been mentioned in the previous two talks. This is the Strait of Europus. This is the Greek mainland here. And this is an island off the, co off the coast of the um, east coast of, of, of Greece. Now, as the tides in the Mediterranean are very small, okay, but they're not zero. They, they a few centimeters in this part of the world, maybe 10 centimeters. And there's a, a different tide, slightly different tide in the northern part of the strait and the southern part of the strait. And that, that tidal height difference is enough to drive a current through the strait. And these are, these are lunar tides, this is a lunar regime, and the, the, the tidal current reverses four times a day. And this was well known by sailors, obviously. And um, it, in, it really infatuated Aristotle. And it supposedly tried, although he, he had trouble actually really understanding that it was four times a day um, reversing with a lunar um, period period rather than the solar period, because it's very noisy. The weather affects the, the, the current as well. Uh, but it, he, he agonized about this for a long time, and it may have, con in some stories, it may have contributed to his, uh, his death in some way. But this actually wasn't understood properly until about 15 years ago, um, well, 20 years ago now, by my colleague, Nicky Simplis, who actually um, built a computer model of this uh, strait and was actually Probably finally to understand it properly. Um, and then, if you can race through these uh, these Greek and Roman characters, Posidonius was the is one of the heroes, and he, he also studied the tides at Cadiz. And he, he the first really to, important thing was to point out that the the ocean tide correspond the periods of the ocean tide corresponds pretty much with the um, heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon. He described um, uh, the motion of the moon leading to spring and uh, deep tides. And he described the diurnal inequality that I mentioned before, because of the declination of the moon. Um, Strabo, with his geography, he remarked on the tides of the Persian Gulf, where there are um, once a day, not, not twice a day, but we're used to. Um, Pliny the Elder is famous, of course, really for um, volcanology, really, but um, he, he was. Um, uh, for me, he, the main thing was he, he pointed out that the solar tides vary through the year. And he, so he discussed um, equinoctial spring tides. So if that supermoon had occurred a few weeks ago, it would have been an equino a giant equinoctial spring tide. Uh, and so that's what he, one of the things he, um, he described. And he also discussed the difference between lunar transit when the moon passes over your um, uh, meridian and uh, the, next, the next high tide. He was quite a character. And I'll look, in, the, in, the, in with those Greeks and Romans, I'll also lump in the, the big Venerable Bede. And he, in his um, various writings, he noticed lots of things. So basically, in 354 days, he noticed that the tide, there are 684 tides, and not 708. <coughs> so the tides on the east coast of England uh, were generated by the moon, not the sun. And what I never properly understood about his writings was he said it to have observed the progression of the tide down the east coast of England. So this is a correct description of a progressive wave, which the tide is. And um, this, is, it, this is a remarkable um, observational achievement. And in Bede's um, writings, you can find these beautiful tidal rota, circular descriptions of the tide. Uh, which I don't understand, but I had a student once who claimed he did understand it, so I can, I can point you at his sort of thesis. <laughs> <coughs> now then, moving on a bit into the more, slightly more modern era, if you, once you start to produce tide tables, then you're in business, because you then, you might not understand things properly, but you, you can see patterns in, 
in the way that things occur, and you can build up a, a predictive mechanism. And the first tide tables described by Yang and company uh, really are, were, were for the, the, board, the large board, tidal balls which occur on the, on the on Chinese rivers. And these first tide tables predicted, like, just like you get a tide table today when you go to the coast, these were first produced about 1000 AD. And it's quite an easy thing actually get tide tables today for if, you, if you're in the business of um, surfing on, on, the, on the River Seven. You see, you can find, we can sell you actually at the best, um, the best time to use a go and do your surfing. But anyway, the, the first tide tables in, um, in Europe were about the same time as the, as the Chinese ones. And usually, the, um, uh, John of Wallingford is uh, given the credit uh, for doing that. I'll come back to the other words in that a bit later. This is actually um, his tide table for the flood at London Bridge. So this is when you have high, the flood means high water. So this is, these are predicted uh, times for high water at London Bridge for, I think, two months. And uh, actually, this was only, only discovered uh, in the 19th century. It wasn't you know, that well known before. It was discovered by, by John Lubbock. Now, what, if you look at these, um, uh, these, uh, um, these times here, they're actually um, lunar transit times. There's nothing in it, uh, really. It's just the moon, not knowing what the moon is producing the tide, and he, and he lags it. So he says the high water, the flood at London Bridge, is almost four hours after the moon goes over, which is quite correct. Uh, so that he calls, he, this was called a tide table, even though it wasn't really anything to do with the tide, it was really a, um, a lunar transit uh, table. So, um, and then, okay, similar measurements were made uh, in the 17th century by the first astronomer royal, and uh, these were this is start to be good, practical, practical developments producing timetables. So I've got to skip here um, uh, a great part of history and refer you to my former boss's book, uh, David Cartwright, who wrote a history of tides, which is still in print. Um, the previous speaker referred to Galileo's um, uh, um, theory of the tides, and Galileo. I wasn't going to talk about this, but as the previous speaker, um, Galileo believed that the sun generated the tides, but he wasn't, he wasn't another Carswell. His, his, his theory was actually very plausible, very um, um, superficially plausible. And of course, it was, it was um, developed um, to support Copernicus' uh, theory of, uh, of the universe. Um, but what Galileo never did, he never, again, he never had a proper physical theory. So he didn't have a Newton uh, for coming uh, along. So. So um, these were failures, and also Descartes as well. These were um, interesting theories of the tides which were wrong. So we have to skip to the great man, and as you will uh, know better than me, of course, the, this uh, revolutionized things totally by um, under, trying to understand, explaining the gravity. But we have to wait until the, um, the third book really in 1726, it's quite late, and this is the one that has all the tides in it. So what, what, this, this, what this described again was uh, why we have spring neap tides, due to both the moon and the sun in combination. The solar tides are biggest in winter, when the earth is closest to the sun, perihelion. Um, spring tides are larger and smaller when we have uh, lunar perigee close to syzygy, that's to say that we have the perigee is lined up with the when the perigee lines up with the moon, sun, and earth lining up, which is what, what happened last Monday, pretty much. And he also uh, described, again, diagonal inequality uh, due to deformation. So this was, this was um, all we needed to know, really. So he described that, those, all that stuff that we saw before. With Halley, uh, Holy gets, gets left out a lot, really, but it's really thanks to him. And he made his own uh, tidal studies. Um, and also, he paid for the Principia, which, which is, is, um, was good in, in itself. And it's worth pointing out at this point, really, that uh, Newton didn't have it, things all his own way. Um, alongside Newton, there were, there were things like the Hutchinsonian movement, which was um, a reactionary, um, fundamentalist sort of a approach to things, who, who totally rejected the idea of gravity. And uh, this, this actually was very powerful, it involved the, the, the crown, the church, and the state. 
And uh, to some extent, the people who are historians of science, which I'm not, uh, but that explains to some extent why uh, research on tides went from England, where, where, where Newton and Halley had done great stuff, and it went to France. Uh, so well, this is what Rossiter, uh, who was also my previous boss years ago, called the, the doldrums of British tidal science for about 100 years. Oh yeah, this is one of uh, Hogarth's uh, drawing sections. And then this shows uh, this lady up here sitting on the moon, uh, drenching these rats, and these rats are the rats of John Hutchinson, and they're, they're trying to eat the uh, Newton's work down here, but she's getting, she's getting rid of them. I think she's called them for midnight, this uh, lady up here. Anyway, this, this, we, this is not very well known, but this was a big uh, problem in the early 18th century um, in England, an intellectual argument. So the, the initiative went to France, and I really haven't got time to too much, talk too much about this, but in 1738, the Academy of Sciences um, offered a prize for the best essay on the tide, the flux and reflux of the sea. And there were four candidates, some very famous names in mathematics and physics, but the one, the one who won it was Bernoulli. We, we, have, we have to thank the Bernoulli family for so much in life uh, these days, from things like why do aeroplanes fly, all kinds of things like that. And, uh, you know, through to the tides, they, they, they did so much. And uh, I haven't got time to describe all this, but basically Bernoulli took the tidal forces that I described in that first diagram, but now but for both the sun and the moon. And he, he basically did some very simple uh, mathematics uh, to show how they combine. And um, in the process, he again, he then produced the very first um, practical tide tables <coughs> which were really um, accurate. Now this, this tide table here is not for anywhere in particular. It's tempting to say this is for um, somewhere like breast, for example. And it could be used for breast, but actually it's a generic tide table. You can use it for almost anywhere where, where the tides are like they are around uh, the French coast or, or British coast. You just have to fiddle with, with it a bit and you, you get any tide table that you want. And in fact, you can still use them today, actually, in practice. So in, in Britain, in, in England, the first tide tables using Bernoulli's methods were um, uh, in 1771. This is actually from 1781. This is the, the, last, the first one that's, that still survives in the British Library. And these were produced by the Holden family uh, using Bernoulli's methods, which were actually... The Holden family were um, uh, teachers and uh, church people. They, they were not the great scientists of the world, but they knew enough about Bernoulli's methods and they so that they could produce their own tide tables. Let's get over that. And again, I have to um, refer you to David's book uh, for that. We're now getting through from uh, the late 18th century into the 19th century. So there are all kinds of famous names in the 19th century um, uh, to do with uh, tides. Um, Darwin, especially. George Darwin, that is, not Charles. Um, Kelvin, and then you go through into the 20th century, there are the famous names like uh, Joseph Proudman or Arthur Dudson, um, which are described all in that book. So, what, what's happened in the 19th century, and which is still the case today, is that the tide is uh, described really in a very simple way in the sense of um, harmonics, or if you like, satellites in frequencies that are, are, are basic astronomical frequencies that are in what's called the tidal potential. Now, if, if, if the, the moon and the sun were very simply on the equator and they had perfectly simple orbits, circular orbits, then you could describe the tides just with two harmonics. So you can describe, this is describing the tide as simply the uh, combination of cosines here like this with uh, an amplitude, a frequency, and a phase lag. Now, if, you, if, the, uh, if the moon and the sun were, were simple situations, you just need two, two terms here, that, that will be it. Uh, but because they're not on the equator, they have a complicated orbit, they have um, elliptical orbits, uh, and so on and so on, then you, you actually need, need many, many terms here to describe the tide properly. But each of those complications 
you can describe in the sense of being, of being another fictitious satellite out there. Um, and in, in fact, in practice, you need about 100 uh, terms to describe the tide really properly. So, it's, so what this is doing is simply parameterizing um, the tide due to the real sun and the moon in terms of, of 100 objects out there which have um, perfect um, circular orbits. So this, this is really um, the same as what we do today. And um, once you're in that business, of course, of doing cosines, you can, you can uh, program it very simply. And that's what uh, Kelvin and company did um, in the 19th century. This is his first uh, tidal prediction machine, which is in the Science Museum. And this had 10 components. So this is, this is not... Um, uh, you couldn't really use this in a practical situation, I think, um, but um, it, it, it showed really what was possible um, at, the, at the time. We're talking here um, 1870 or so. Um, so, um, and then as time went on, of course, they didn't have, di didn't have digital computers in those days, but as time went on, uh, they, the bigger and bigger versions of these were built. And this is one that we have in Liverpool, which is, um, has 42 components. This was actually built in 1950, uh, just before uh, modern digital computers came along. And I, I've got a little movie showing how it works, which I'll, I'll, I won't bother with. Okay, okay. So this basically a big clock. These are made by the people who were skilled uh, clocks, clocksmen. And, um, uh, oh, there you go, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, press that one. Ah, right, okay. So basically here, these wheels are, uh, the wheels have a certain uh, frequency, a certain period, if you want, and also they have a certain uh, phase lag, and they, they're converting, um, this circular motion here is being uh, converted into sinusoidal motion by, by uh, mechanics. And that sinusoidal motion is then being, being added up between each of these wheels by the, the wire that you see connecting them. And uh, so every, every um, uh, wheel is either a, um, a lunar or a solar component. So it's stopped actually at this one here, and this is M4. So the main twice daily lunar tide is called M2. This is M4, so this is there, there's a tide which has a period of about uh, six hours and not 12 hours. So that's what this one is. The M2's wheel is down here somewhere. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, should we go back to the part? Yeah. Thanks. So these were. Um, these still work. We, we, we've, we've had this working, um, they've been refurbished by um, National Galleries in Liverpool uh, recently, and this is, this is a pretty good instrument now. We can, uh, we can <laughs> should we want to, we could use this to produce uh, tide tables, um, which are as good as, as good as computers can do, do today. Oh. Okay. So finally, to, uh, to wrap up, um, just to talk about the, the modern uh, situation, we, we now have um, lots and lots of data about the tide from every bit of water around the world, basically. So basically, every bit of coastline uh, pretty much has got things called tide gauges, which measure the water level change from one minute to the next. And of course, these tide gauges are used um, not just for tides, but for measuring um, or flood, flood warning and so on. Um, but so we know the tide at the coast from tide gauges. We know the tide in the deep ocean by putting pressure sensors on the, on the seabed. And we can actually measure the, uh, the tide from space using radar uh, from satellites. And of course, just like um, the weather, weather forecasting and so on, uh, computers come into this a lot. And you can use the dynamics of the tide, uh, knowledge of the physics of the tide, within computer models to, um, together with the measurements, to actually end up with a, um, an excellent model. So just as examples, this is um, 
a modern tie gauge. Um, yeah, this is a radar, simple radar device. It bounces radar up and down off the sea surface and measures the, um, the, the tide. This is, a, this is actually at the Ile Dex uh, near La Rochelle. This is where Napoleon surrendered in 1815, by the way. Um, and then you can measure, we can measure the, um, the tide on the seabed using uh, pressure sensors, which are within devices like this. And we can use, again, we can use radar from satellites. This is Jason 2 satellite. And this can bounce uh, radar uh, off the sea surface and back. And by measuring the time it takes, and if you know where the satellite is, then you can measure the change uh, in the sea level, and that gives when we know about the time. And um, so you end up with maps like this. So this is a map for uh, M2. So M2 is the main twice daily tide uh, due to the moon. And this is actually much more complicated than the, those two tidal bulges I showed you before. Uh, why, why is that? It's, it's because um, the, the tidal forces may be simple, it may have those two, two bulges, but the ocean will do what it wants. It's a bit like playing a musical instrument. You can, you can twang the string and you can blow on it or something, but the instrument will ultimately do what it wants. And the ocean is the same thing. So it's being driven by, by the tidal forces, but the actual tide that you get around the world um, is, is, is actually quite complicated. And you see here in red, red and brown, these are areas where the, the tide, M2, part of the tide anyway, is very, very big, like around where we live. And there are other parts of the world, shown in blue, where there's almost nothing at all. And the, the white lines uh, show the progression uh, of the tide. So in this case, um, this, this progression shown by the arrow, the tide that we experience here in Britain is due to the tide coming up the North Atlantic from the south, um, like so. So the point I want to make about this map is that uh, we know, this is good to about five millimeters, okay? So we know the tide everywhere in the world to about five millimeters, which is something to think that um, uh, Aristotle would have, would have, would have been amazed. Um, Okay, so I'm not, I haven't come all the way to Oxford not to, not to plug books. Um, so the, again, the, um, this is, um, again, I mentioned my, my boss, so if you're interested in the history of tides, you can't do better than, than read that. And you can read my book as well, which, which, uh, uh, which came out two years ago with David Pugh. And uh, you can see it has the moon proudly on the, on the cover. Okay, time for lunch. Hi, um, I'm an astronomer of amateur nature, but, so I'm obviously going to project this out beyond our own um, environment onto a look. We're looking at Jupiter, we're looking at the moon to Jupiter, we're looking at Saturn and its moons and so on. Yeah. So we've got a lot of things to look at, tidally speaking. Right. Um, is there any research, i.e. looking at the tides on other yes, astronomical yes. bodies? Yes, 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 I have a pal who looks at tides on Europa. Okay, yes. Uh, there, there are ocean, thought, as you know, there are thought to be oceans on these on Yes, these moons, I, I wonder, can you tell us something about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But they're, 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 um, uh, they're a friend in Brothers Space Flight Centre. I can give you papers. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, very much following on from the previous question. I'm interested in the, the tidal flow that we have on Earth. There seems to be a colossal amount of water uh, sloshing around, if you like. Yes. Uh, a terrific mass of water. Yes. And not only surely this is having an effect on the Earth's crust. Yes. Is there any correlation at all between the tidal flow due to the moon and earthquake phenomena? On oh, Earth? uh, no. It, it this is one of uh, this is a, this is one of the. Maybe somebody will prove me wrong in, in 10 years and I'll be an idiot. But they, 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 the people have tried for a long time to relate to earthquake. Okay, the, the ocean tide, as you say, is a, is a great lump of water and it, it loads the solid earth. And the solid earth has a, a, what's called a loading tide on it. The, the solid earth that we're just sitting on here is going up and down 20, 20 centimeters a day, twice a day. And it, there's two components to that. One is the so-called body tide, which is like the tidal forces I showed you before. It has that simple shape. 
The other is called the loading tide component, and that's due to the ocean tide loading the solid earth, as you say. Now, uh, some people in the past have, have suggested that, that this loading, this stressing of the solid earth might, might somehow gen generate earthquakes. And the people have tried to, to relate them, and um, I don't think there's any respectable evidence for that. So but some people think that is. So the coincidence between the recent New Zealand earthquakes and the Italian earthquakes with the supermoon phenomenon Oh, it's, gosh. It's coincidental. Yes. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I, th I think it's, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't okay. think that. Sorry, if I may, just to follow yeah. up on that. This, this is a question, I mean, there does seem to be other coincidences, you know, as you say, alongside supermoon, but people have done research on seeing whether, you know, the idea of a supermoon has an effect on geological um, action in the Earth, and the answer has always come up, no. Because remember, there's at least one supermoon every year. Okay, it's just that it was a particularly closer one this week, and so it, it, it really is just thought to be coincidence. These things are going to happen, or if they happen, it's not because of the supermoon. Yeah, the, there's a lot of instrumentation out there these days. I mean, the, the world is almost covered in GPS receivers to measure the changes in the land surface and gravity meters and things like that. So, if, if there is any evidence in the longer term, I'm sure. Solid Earth people will get to the bottom of it. I think maybe something to remember is that the tides happen in a regular pattern, the earthquakes happen all the time. So there isn't you know, a clear correlation, is that basically. Right. Uh, thanks for your talk. I, I think I might be saying that Newman himself realised, on the basis of the phenomenon of the tides, that the density of the moon and the density of the sun must be very different. Right. Now, more recently, Stephen Balbus here, who's a professor of astrophysics here in Oxford, has combined the phenomenon of the tides with the theory of continental drift, the motion of tectonic plates in the, the history of the Earth, to argue that if the size, the optical size of the moon was not almost exactly the same as the sun, the development of intelligent life on this planet. Oh. <laughs> I just wondered if... I don't know. I, you I don't, don't know about no. <laughs> that. Yeah. Because otherwise, the, I don't know if there are any theories as to why it is that the optical size of the moon comes Well, um, I, no, no. It, the, you, you, could, you could thank the moon to some extent. I mean, it, there are people who believe that um, I mean, if you want to go back to things like the origin of life and, and so on, the, the moon, the, the tides played an important role in the, in the drying and wetting of um, uh, rock pools, for example. And you can go uh, from that through um, uh, proteins and DNA and all, all the rest of it. Um, and then these theories then compete with other people who think life started in the, in the deep sea and in, the, in, the, in vents. And that's. So the moon could have, could have played a part in, in, the, in us being here. That, you know, the rock pool idea is correct. Again, I'm not an expert on that. <laughs> Over here. Uh, okay, now, what about the other way around? What about the effects of the Earth on the Moon with the tidal forces on the Moon? Yes. And also, uh, I can't remember. Uh, but we're saying Jupiter, the nearest satellite to Jupiter. Oh. Eternally, the, 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 people, the people who use uh, superconducting super gravity meters to measure earth tides can, can, can measure the uh, tides in the solid earth due to the planets. But you, but you can't, you can't um, see, there's no measurable effect in the ocean tide uh, due to, due to uh, is that what you meant? Um, the, I mean, the, uh, no, yeah, the, the Earth has an effect on the Moon primarily yeah. due to um, lunar deceleration, as Carolyn mentioned, a few centimetres a century. Mm -hmm. the and that, that was when she was, was describing the ellipses and what Richard Stevenson did uh, to measure the, the rate of change of um, uh, lunar, de lunar uh, deceleration. Um, so, that, so the Earth has an effect on the Moon. Um, what was your point about the planets? Oh yeah, how would Jupiter have the nearest satellite to Jupiter? Because it's so oh. close. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, sorry. Right. Yes. Talking. 
Yes, I think then you need to combine um, <coughs> people, people modeling tides on such satellites with the geology of those things, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's not your field. Okay. Like an IO, I guess. That's, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I'm sure there are people here who know more about that. <laughs> Uh, with regard to the um, forecasting of global times, do you take the effect of coastal profiles into account while trying to model them mathematically? Or coastal you, profiles? Yeah. Oh. Or do you use observational measurements to sort of um, make adjustments to your model? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, the coastal profile in the sense of simply the shape of a continent. You yeah, that clearly affects. Oh yes, it's yes. We don't live on a, on an Earth, which I is. Um, whether you try to set up a mathematical model of the profile. Yes. Or whether you use um, measure observations to um, freak, if you like, the results to give you the sort of coming. <coughs> well, uh, if if you start from which I've done myself in the past, if, if you start simply with um, uh, a computer model of the the, the known. Uh, um, size and, and depth of the ocean basins and, and, the, and, the, and the coastline uh, shape. And you, you, put, you make the moon and the sun, you put the tidal forces in, and then you have, you've got to have a, a couple of fiddle, fiddle things because the, the tides um, dissipate themselves through friction. So you have to have a, a mechanism for that. But using that alone, you can generate a, a very good map of the ocean tide, as I showed you there before. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Now the observations come in, like, um, just like in weather forecasting, etc. these days. You, you have, you have, when you have a good model, you try and assimilate data into it because you know perfectly well that your model is not perfect, so you try and assimilate. So those measurements I mentioned before are used to uh, be assimilated into the model to, to make, it, make it better. So yeah, the, the shape of the coast, we don't live on a world which is, is, has a uniform uh, shallow ocean on it, and the, the, the shape of continental coastlines is is vitally important. A lot of those red blobs I showed you there, like um, around Britain, a large part of the reason for the tide that we, that, we, that we actually have is due to resonance, local resonances, and due to the shape of the coastlines. And um, yeah, so the shape is, is important. I have another question, Mr. Roy. Yeah, I'd just like to, I mean, I have no connection at all with, with David Cartwright, but I'd just like to add to your plug for his book. I, I think it's one of the best scientific books I've ever read. So yeah. Uh, please look. But um, pick up on, on the question of resonance. Um, uh, I've uh, come across mention somewhere of some notions that presumably as a result of the basin expanding with continental drift, yeah. that the whole of the Atlantic is gradually coming into resonance. Uh, well, the Arctic as a whole is going out of resonance. I, I, I yeah. so. but, but, I mean, during, during um, the last ice age, the tides were much bigger on the um, uh, Canadian uh, coast, American yeah. coast. Yeah, because the, the, the assertion that I've come across is, is that it's therefore a mistake to suppose that the global tidal friction was greater in the past yeah. because the moon was, was nearer, because that's the configuration of the oceans has changed. Yes, that's right. There's, there's, there's a big modeling challenge in, in that, you're right. So I think some places are getting into, into, into resonance. The Bay of Fundy, I think, is getting into resonance. That was, that was, that was much debated when the, the idea, um, the tidal borrow scheme was, was being yeah. proposed. Yeah. yeah, thanks. But Bay of Fundy is almost perfectly in resonance already, actually. Yeah. Some questions over here. So it's supposed to happen. Moon has an effect on tides of water and earth. Does it mean that it has an effect on uh, atmosphere? So yes, so the tides on the atmosphere. Yes. Is, is it yes. something we can study or it's too complicated with too many? No, uh, uh, <laughs> I mentioned um, Napoleon uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> you should know these things better. Uh, okay, so Napoleon uh, was incarcerated by us in St. Helena and in a, um, a house called Longwood House in uh, St. Helena. And that was the, um, by chance, that was the, the same building that the, um, the lunar air tide was discovered. Uh, and um, I'm, afraid, I'm ashamed to say I forgot the name of the fellow who discovered it. But the way these things go, it was actually reported by um, uh, <coughs> a guy called Sabine, who was president of the Royal Society, who got the credit for it. Uh, but it was actually an army officer <coughs> measuring the problem. It's a couple of millibars. It's quite measurable. 
and so on. Uh, and um, yeah, but it's tight, so. and, and there's ties to the atmosphere and, and the effect, the effect on the satellites. Um. <coughs> um, so my question is because it's, it's, it's a tides it's in a coffee, coffee cup. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so my question arises because um, although I did. Um, physics and philosophy here as an undergraduate with Harvey, actually. I now work in philanthropy. So I was really interested in what you said about Edmund Halley having funded uh, Principia. Oh, yeah, I'm sure people know more about it than I do. Yeah. Yes, I wonder whether you or anybody, if anyone knows that story, I'm really interested to hear it. I don't know if it's just because the Royal Society has spent all its money on that book about speech. You know? I'm and, and, okay, can, we, can you tell me? Okay. Um, the Royal Society has a certain amount of money to uh, fund the publication of the book. <coughs> they had two choices. Uh, one was Newton's Pricky, the other was Francis Willoughby's Illustrated History of Fishes. And they went with Willoughby's History of Fishes, leaving no money for the Principia, so how he coughed up instead. So he, so he was just in the room at the time and put his hand up? <laughs> no, no, um, Halley was, uh, Newton didn't want the publisher of Brinkibia because he hated Robert Hooke because Robert Hooke was a big guy in the Royal Society. He refused to publish the Brinkibia, but Edmund Halley was sent by the Royal Society in quite a long, drawn-out process of persuading him to publish over three or four years. Any other questions? That's one behind the <laughs> Uh, not a question. I'm from the Scientific Instrument Society. We've recently changed our executive officer, which has put pressure on space. Consequently, I bought a large number of the Scientific Instrument Society's bulletins, which will be on the table at the front as you go out. Do help yourself. Do have a look on the website if you're not lucky, or if you're not even lucky at all with one, try and have a peek with somebody else's. No, or likely implications of global warming on this type of ah, system. Okay, uh, great question, yeah. the the. Um, the tides play a, um, a large part in mixing the ocean, and uh, maybe um, half, the, the reason that the ocean gets, gets mixed is, is half due to the tides and half due to the wind, wind processes. So we have a climate change, you change the ocean circulation, the in, interaction between that and um, the other components of the, of the, of the Earth system will, will change. Now, I, I don't know of any um, global circulation model, which is the models that we use for climate prediction uh, having to, ever, ever taken tides into account uh, properly. But um, having said that, um, there are small changes which are not understood in the, in the measurements of the tide uh, now, o over the last hundred years or so. Uh, and these have got nothing to do, we, we know from, uh, they've got nothing to do that we can explain uh, due to the moon and sun, uh, uh, long-term changes in their orbits. So it's possible that these small changes that, that, that have been observed are, are somehow climate related. But I don't know of any, any uh, coherent explanation uh, of all that. But in the future, okay, another naive answer is, in the future, if, if you change the depth of the ocean, if climate change changes sea level, average sea level, then uh, everything changes. The, the, the tide, tidal propagation will change. It goes like square root. Uh, G times F depth, and um, storm surges will change as well. I don't think will change. Um, I'm trying to formulate a more question on the basis of deep ignorance. Um, I've never read Newton on the tides, and after what you said, I think that's the next thing I'll do. And I suppose my question falls into the category of what counts as a proper theory of the tides? Oh, because you know. The, uh, for many centuries, people knew it correlated with the positions of the sun and the moon, and they also knew the data of how it was varying locally. Um, and you've got the very high level theory of the astronomy, which you mentioned, but as you said, there are lots of kind of fiddle factors and modeling and so yeah. forth. So, I mean, one could, I suspect one could almost dispense with Newton's laws of gravity and still work on kind of modeling the data and come up with a, a, an adequate model well, of the tides. So what counts as a Theory of well, the theory of and the low-level observations which are then <coughs> I think I think the standard physics answer is that a good theory is one that explains the observation or something has some predictive value. I mean, you do I, I do get fairly regularly um, 
uh, bonkers ideas about tides. Tides is one of those things that, that seems to generate people's interest and, and you get theories of tides come along. These days often from Chinese people, actually. And, and uh, it, they're, they're great fun. And, and actually uh, trying to demolish them is actually quite inter interesting intellectually. And in your example, Galileo is a good example. That, that's a, that was a very plausible um, uh, description of the tides. It, it was only lacking in two things. He, 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 didn't, he couldn't explain if they were solar induced, it would have to have been 12 hours and not 12 hours, 24 minutes. And also he would have had, um, uh, had to have had just one, one tide a day, not, not two. So that's a good example of a theory which has a, a, a predictable uh, component which you can demolish. So, that's only, uh, so a good theory is only one that fits the facts. So do I just a quick follow up then. Um, if Newton's theory of gravity is the point at which one has a good theory of the tides, I guess it doesn't have much produce a very high percentage of predictive value of the models that you're using? Um, well, the, the, the tidal potential is really just Newton's laws. 